In this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, crystals and the crystal lattice. Most of you are familiar with this from undergrad chemistry and undergrad materials engineering classes, so we're not going to be talking about different crystal structures and symmetries. Instead, we're going to be talking about the reciprocal lattice and the mathematics you need to think about crystallinity and periodicity. The reason that we're doing this is because when we think about the electronic structure of the material, we should be thinking about these electrons as waves that are passing through a crystal. And as with all waves, they are going to be interacting with the periodicity of, of the charge density, and that is going to give us uh, properties for example, the scattering of, of electrons. So in this lecture, we're going to work through the mathematics needed for understanding uh, crystallinity and the reciprocal lattice. And this will be directly applicable to uh, a free electron uh, model in which we have free electrons that are moving through a lattice interacting with atoms. So crystals are, are defined as being made of, of two parts. One, a periodic lattice, and second, an atomic basis. So we'll have some set of lattice points, and this is going to be a two-dimensional lattice, that are related to each other through a set of lattice vectors. And these vectors are vectors that point from one lattice point to the next. Now, the periodicity of a crystal means that anything that happens near one lattice point happens near the others in an exact, in the exact same fashion. So, like that, the lattice vectors can be used to describe the translation through space of the events. The uh, atomic basis, if the lattice vectors were using uh, A sub uh, I, uh, the atomic basis, we're going to use uh, a set of vectors Ri that describe the atomic basis. So, erase my little scribble, I could have, say, at this lattice point in atomic basis, which puts an atom, say, here and here. So R1 and R2. And that means that our crystal is described by etc. So, given this, if you have a particular set of lattice vectors and a particular set of atomic bases, this is what defines uh, the crystal. Now, so you remember, these lattice vectors, these are not telling you about the atoms, they're telling you about how the atoms, uh, about the periodicity. 
and the lattice vectors, they exist independent of the uh, atoms. So we can, we can think of these as uh, ex describing how we tile space, and then the atoms are going to be uh, carried through that particular tiling. And as a result, lattice vectors can be described uh, mathematically, and we know that there are exactly 14 unique uh, lattices, and these are called the Brave lattices. And then if we talk about lattice vectors and atomic basis, we can start talking about things such as, as space groups, uh, but we're not going to do that here. Uh, here I, I want to be uh, moving to discuss uh, the reciprocal lattice. So let's begin talking about the reciprocal lattice in terms of diffraction. Let's review the real space representation of diffraction known as Bragg's Law. Again, this is something that most of you have probably seen before. The concept is that we have uh, a, a scattering process in which we have uh, coherent x-rays coming in from a source. They uh, scatter coherently, and if the uh, x-rays exit uh, in phase, then you get constructive interference. And that's going to give you uh, uh, a peak in your diffraction pattern. Uh, you get uh, an amplification of, of the signal. And the way that you get constructive interference is you have scattering from two different sources, uh, two different uh, atoms or atom planes, and the path difference uh, for the x-rays are an integral uh, wavelength. So if we have atom planes like this, so these are planes of atoms, and we have incoming x-rays, so I'm going to draw my normal here, that's my normal vector, and I've got incoming x-rays, my detector sitting over here, and I've arranged my detector so that theta, theta that means that I can draw a different color here. Let's pick a red. I pick, uh, I draw a, a, a line that is uh, marking Right angles. This then is the difference in the path length. We're defining our spacing here using the variable d. Then that means that 2d sine theta is the extra path length, 
and the only way you get constructive interference is if that is equal to an integer multiple of the wavelengths. So, equal to n lambda, where n is an integer. Now, from a practical perspective, if you're thinking about Bragg's Law and say you've got a theta to theta diffractometer, then you really are uh, typically thinking of n equals 1. And that's because you're going to get the, the strongest signal, and it's going to be right in the uh, uh, angle of, of highest uh, incidence, of highest uh, scattering. Uh, but you can certainly get diffraction from higher order uh, planes, and in fact, we, we do get that. And one of the, the weaknesses of this particular uh, description is, is that it's not particularly useful for us when uh, trying to describe the more subtle diffraction that's occurring of electrons that are moving through a crystal, which is why we're going to move to a, a uh, reciprocal space representation. We need to begin by defining some of the mathematical basis that we're going to be working with. Beginning with the translation vector. The translation vector describes points within our lattice that are identical. So T is, is, is a vector, A1, 2, and 3 are our lattice vectors, and U those are our integers that describe integer translations within our lattice. So if we have our lattice made up of points, then a translation would be, for example, here to here, or here to here, or here, or anything that connects two places in the lattice that have identical surroundings. We can use now this translation vector to describe the translation of uh, in space between two regions with identical charge density. So we're going to use n r to describe the charge density at some point described by vector r. And because of the translation vector, we now have that uh, the charge density at point r is also equal to the charge density at point r plus t. Okay, that works. Now, because we're dealing with a periodic system with periodic boundary conditions, and we have this translation vector, and we know that the charge is what we're describing within that, uh, we're going to work within a Fourier sine and cosine expansion. So to begin with, let's, let's think about a, a one-dimensional crystal. So I'm going to draw my one-dimensional crystal here, and I'll describe my one-dimensional crystal in terms of uh, lattice points. Like that, uh, this distance is a unit cell, and 
our lattice parameter is A. Our charge density, which was a vector, we'll translate that into just the x variable because it's a one-dimensional crystal. Okay, so now we can write out the Fourier sine and cosine uh, expansion Okay, so in this expression, we've got our cosine and sine. We're taking a sum, and I, I chose p as our index for the summation. So we have a c sub p, we've got a p in the cosine, a s sub p, and a p in the sine. These, and cp and sp, are real coefficients that give us the amplitude of each particular uh, sine and cosine contribution. So this is entirely consistent then with our understanding of periodicity, and then you can see that if you take and substitute in uh, n x plus a in for x, because if you do that, then you wind up with n0 plus some this, putting in x plus a, uh, we can then distribute our 2 pi p. Uh, 2 pi p over a through this to get, uh, I'll just write it out, cosine 2 pi p over a plus A's cancel here and here, and because sine x plus 2 pi p is equal to sine x cosine x plus 2 pi P cosine x, right? We know that if I take any point and I translate it, I'm sorry, I should draw this appropriately. And I translated by 2 pi is equal, and these are just now integer multiples of 2 pi. And this comes back out as n0 
sum z p cosine two pi p over a x plus s p sine two pi p over a x is equal to n x. So we get back our we get back our uh, we get back our uh, original charge density if we translate it by a. So what's worth noting here is that in this expansion. to making this work is this 2 pi p a, 2 pi p over a, right? So this is what allows the Fourier expansion to give us this periodicity. And in fact, this set of points where p is our integers, this is our reciprocal lattice. And we can write our reciprocal lattice in a reciprocal unit cell, reciprocal lattice uh, representation. So let me draw this out. I'm going to use a green. So our reciprocal lattice looks like this. Zero. 2 pi over a, 2 pi over a 2, 2 pi over a 3, dot dot dot, minus 2 pi over a, minus 2 pi over a 2, minus 2 pi over a 3, dot dot dot, and the distance between each of the points in the reciprocal lattice is given by 2 pi over a. And where we defined our crystal in terms of the translation vectors, we're going to define our uh, reciprocal lattice using this large or capital G. So our reciprocal lattice is going to be given by G. Now, we're going to take that Fourier sine and cosine expansion, and now we're going to reformulate that in a, in a more compact form. And a more compact form of that will be, and actually I'm going to write it up here in the corner because I'm going to try to keep it around for a while. Nx is equal to the sum over p n sub p exponential of i 2 pi over a p x. So this is the way we're going to write our charge density. Our charge density uh, can be written in terms of a summation, and it's a summation over our reciprocal lattice. Uh, it's worth noting that in the process of going from the sine and cosine to this exponential expression, we now have a uh, uh, imaginary a number inside of our exponential, and this is now a complex number. And of course, p is an integer. Well, what does it mean that this n, our charge density, is, is real? 
Well, if our charge density is real and our coefficients are complex, that can only happen if the coefficient in the Fourier expansion at plus p is equal to the coefficient at point minus p is complex conjugate. So that way, when we're working on this side and this side and we're taking the summation over all p, uh, they're going to cancel, well, they're going to combine to give us a real charge density. So consider we're taking this summation. Well, that means that we're taking a summation from minus infinity to minus 1. We're taking a summation at 0 and a summation from uh, plus 1 to plus infinity. If we match up our plus and minus terms, then we get NP e to the i 2 pi over a p x plus n minus p e to the i 2 pi over a p x. Each of these can be written out as their sine and cosine expansions, so we get n p cosine 2 pi p over a x plus i sine 2 pi p over a x plus n of minus p cosine 2 pi p over a x minus i sine 2 pi p over a x. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. I'm going to put the explicitly put a minus p in that exponential. And because of that minus sign, we have a minus sign in front of the i sign. Uh, whereas with a plus p, uh, the, uh, you have a plus sign in front of the i sign. Okay, so then combining these two, we get n p plus n minus p cosine 2 pi p over a x plus i n p minus n minus p sine 2 pi p over a x. Okay, we know our cosine and sine are real. So that means that for these terms to be real, then this term must be real, and this term also must be real. So for those to be real, then uh, this implies that a plus b i plus c plus d i. So if I said n p is a plus b i and n minus p is c plus d i, I just picked uh, a, b, and c as uh, members of, of, the, uh, of uh, the reals, and then I put the complex uh, i in there. So this implies that 
b is equal to minus d. And then over on this side, we have i a plus b i minus c minus d i. So we put the i in there and the negative, and I carry the negative through, and this implies that a is equal to c. And the only way, well, for this and this to be true is if the n plus p and the n minus p are, in fact, complex conjugates of each other. We also know that nx and np are related to each other uh, through uh, integration. So if you have if you have well, I'll write the answer down over here and then I'll go back and show it. We know that NP is equal to 1 over A, the integral from 0, that again, N sub P is equal to 1 over A, the integral from 0 to A dx of N x exponential of negative i 2 pi p over a x. And, and we know that because we can substitute an x into this. Let me show you what happens there. If we substitute uh, an x into the integral, get NP is equal to 1 over A integral from 0 to A, so we're integrating over one lattice, dx, sum P prime. So I'm, I'm uh, putting the dummy variables P prime uh, in for the substitution of NX. N P prime exp of i 2 pi over a p prime minus p x. Now, p prime and n p prime, uh, they don't depend on x, right? Because they're coming from this and x, which means that we can move those and the summation outside of the integral. So we can rewrite this as 1 over a, the sum over p prime, n p prime, the integral from 0 to a, x of i 2 pi over a p prime minus p x dx. When p is equal to p prime, then we get 1 over a np integral from 0 to a e to the 0, right, because those subtract dx and e to the 0 or anything raised to the 0 is equal to 1. So we integrate 1 
phi dx from 0 to a, and that just gives us back np. And if p is not equal to p prime, then we get a over i 2 pi 1 over p prime minus p e raised to the i 2 pi over a p prime minus p a minus e to the 0. This is taking the integral and substituting in uh, our integration limits. This is 1. This expression can be rewritten as e to the i 2 pi some integer say j, because that's just some integer, j, um, which is equal to 1. So 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. So the only time that you get a non-zero is when p is equal to p prime, and then it just returns np. So this is what we get for our one-dimensional crystal, and we can now take and translate this to the three-dimensional case. So I'm going to uh, rewrite these three dimensions. R. So R is a, a vector describing some position in three-dimensional space is equal to the sum over G N G X of I G dot R. So the G is the reciprocal lattice, so we're taking a sum over all the points in the reciprocal lattice, so you can write that out as a uh, you know triple uh, summation, but I'm just writing it out just as a sum over a vector because it's uh, shorter. And then we have a relationship between n g and r. That's the integral n g is equal to one over volume of the unit cell integrating over the cell. Again, this is a, a triple integral, but I'm just going to write V cell here because it's shorthand. So dr, r is a vector of n r x of minus i g dot r. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, the cell, we can find from the, the vector product, a1 dot a2 cross a3. And then we're going to define our reciprocal lattice in terms of our lattice vectors. So bi is equal to 2 pi over the volume of the cell of a j cross a k. 
so where I, J, K are cyclic. Can't spell C, Y, C, L, I, cyclic. And by cyclic, I mean you might have you know, one, two, three, two, three, one, three, two, one for your uh, suffix or your subscript. Okay. This is our reciprocal uh, lattice vectors and the units are one over length. Right, remember in our one dimensional crystal we had two pi p over a. Right? So this was also a one over length. And this is where the name reciprocal comes from, because it's one over the length. And, and another uh, handy property, which we are going to use extensively, is that the relationship between the reciprocal lattice and the uh, uh, lattice vectors necessarily mean that bi dot a j are equal to two two pi del i j the Kronecker delta and you can see this if you take If you take, for example, a uh, one dot b one, I'm sorry, let's say b two. That's going to give you two pi over v a one dot a three cross a one. Right by definition here, which means that this and this are necessarily ortho orthogonal because if you're taking the cross product of three and one, uh, that's going to be orthogonal to both three and one, which means that this has to be zero. And in contrast, if you took a three b three, then you'd have two pi over v a three a uh, one cross a two and this is just the volume so the volume divided by the volume is equal to two pi so that's where this relationship comes from so now We're making progress. Let's now uh, write out our reciprocal lattice vector, G, is equal to V1, B1, plus V2, B2, plus V3, V3. So our reciprocal lattice vector, which we take the sum over, is a sum over the uh, three reciprocal lattice vectors, each one multiplied by an integer. So the outcrop of this is that now n r plus t is equal to the sum over g of n 
G X I G R plus T is equal to the sum over G N G X of I G R X of I G T G dot T gives us B1 B1 plus B2 B2 plus V3 B3 dotting into U1 A1 plus U U2 A2 plus U3 A3 and through the use of this uh, relation this is going to give us 2 pi v1 u1 plus v2 u2 plus v3 u3 and this is just some integer some j so 2 pi integer and we know that making this i 2 pi j j some integer that this becomes 1. So we wind up with this entire expression equal to n r. So this gives us the mathematical toolkit we need to come back and readdress diffraction using a Fourier space representation. Let's look at the physical picture of a charge density that's scattering an incoming x-ray source. So we have some, some charge density, N of R, and we have some incoming uh, plane wave, E to the I K dot R. So k is the wave vector that gives us the wavelength and the direction. And then we have some outgoing direction that we consider. And we can consider all, all these possible directions, but we're just going to consider this one particular outgoing plane wave, e to the i k prime dot r. So k prime is the wave vector of the uh, direction of the outgoing plane wave. So the definition of the scattering amplitude F <coughs> is that it's going to involve the integral over the volume or, or an infinites infinitesimal volume times the charge density within that volume x of minus i delta k dot r. So this delta k is the scattering vector. Okay. 
it is telling us the change in the wave vector. Okay, so this is our, our scattering amplitude, and we'll substitute into that the Fourier expansion for the charge density. So this gives us F is equal to the sum over the reciprocal lattice vectors, integral dV n g exponential of i g minus delta k dot r. Okay? Now, most of the directions we're going to get uh, incoherent scattering. We don't really have any uh, increase in amplitude. There's no uh, there's no constructive interference. But for a particular subset, we do get that. And if delta k is equal to g, any particular g. Let's let's I call it a g. Let's call it a but G1, so a particular uh, reciprocal lattice. So in this top expression, we're talking about the sum over all possible Gs. So this G is the, the list of all possible Gs. And uh, here, we're talking about one particular uh, reciprocal lattice point. So if we have one particular reciprocal lattice point, and then we substitute this back up in, then all of the summation is going to go away because we don't get uh, appreciable scattering, so it's going to go to, go to zero. And I, there's, there's a particular theorem uh, from mathematics that gives us that, and I don't remember it right now, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's going to go away except for the case when g is equal to g1. And this is going to give us f is equal to the integral dv n of g1 exp i g1 minus g1 dot r and this is zero so this goes to one which means that f is equal to V cell N G1. And N G1 we know uh, we can get from the uh, integral. And this is our uh, uh, non-zero diffraction. And th this is uh, only the case when delta k is equal to some particular g. So our condition for diffraction is that the change in the scattering, uh, or not the change in the scattering vector, but the, the scattering uh, vector has to be equal to exactly one particular reciprocal lattice point, and it can be any of those reciprocal lattice uh, vectors. So there's some implications for this. Let me uh, write this up here. Delta k is equal to g. <clears throat> One implication is that G, H, K, L. So I'm going to index at H, K, L to be H, B1 plus K, B2 plus L, B3. And these H, K, L refer to the 
uh, HKL plane So this is uh, from Miller Index Notation, so you can go back and review that if you uh, need. Uh, so if this is an HKL plane, then GHKL is normal to HKL plane. And the second implication is that the despacing for this particular HKL plane is equal to 2 pi divided by the amplitude of G HKL. It's noteworthy that uh, if you're studying diffraction and you're using the uh, the book by Cullody. Uh, Cullody has, all through his text, he has a, a missing uh, 2 pi. So if you're trying to move back and forth between, say, Cullody and uh, Cattell, uh, there's going to be a, a factor of 2 pi uh, different. But let's, let's look at where this comes from. So let's say I've got some planes. I'm just taking, you know, kind of slices, bits of those planes, and I'm going to find my origin to be in the center of, or on one of those planes, and then I will draw a vector out this way. This is a1, a2, a3. So defining where this second plane cuts the uh, cuts the uh, lattice vectors is going to give us a C, and again, by the definition of Miller index notation, A is equal to A1 over H, B is equal to A2 over K, and C is equal to A3 over L. So this is from the definition of Miller index notation. Then that tells us that the segment AB is equal to, I'm going to drop this down a little bit. The segment uh, AB is equal to A2 over K minus A1 over H. So if we take A, B, and dot it into G, H, K, L, we get A2 over K minus A1 over H, dotting into H, B1 plus K, B2 plus L, B3, and Remember, these are all, uh, those aren't vectors there, these aren't either. Uh, then, using Then remembering that the i dot a j is equal to 2 pi 
del i j, that turns this quantity into a2 dot b2 over k k minus a1 dot b1 over h h is equal to 2 pi minus 2 pi is equal to 0. So this segment is uh, perpendicular to the reciprocal lattice vector, which means that it must be the normal out of the surface. So this is this. And if we say we define a point here, this is o, our origin, and call point capital N, the point on the uh, surface of the neighboring plane N, then D H K L is equal to the magnitude of O N is equal to A1 over H dot N. So that is the, uh, the magnitude of this uh, vector projected onto the normal. And because the normal is G over G, we get a1 over h dot h b1 plus k b2 plus l b3 <clears throat> divided by the magnitude of g and again using our relation which I cleverly erased this gives us 2 pi over g. So we're going to be using, using these uh, for our uh, further constructions. So now, uh, we can take and we can go back and we can use this reciprocal space construction to uh, uh, write out the real space Bragg condition. So if we have our atomic planes and we've got some incoming wave. I'm going to trace this down. So I'm going to, I'll just draw it here, why don't I? Okay, then we have our outgoing wave. K prime. This angle is theta, this angle is theta, this angle is 2 theta. Which means that
for this condition to hold, we have a triangle. And let me uh, redraw this. this condition and we have K and we've got K prime which means that this vector which uh, I draw the tail at the tip of K and the tip at the tip of K prime this must be G so we've got that triangle now And if you want to, you can uh, rewrite this G or K plus G. That, frankly, is the way I prefer seeing it, but. Uh, Coming back to this triangle, let me clear this up some. Theta. Okay. If I draw a perpendicular there, that means that I now have theta and one half g. So I have sine theta is equal to one half g divided by k from the trigonometric definition. If I multiply both sides by 2d, now I've got something very close to Bragg's law, but over here I also recognize that d is equal to 2 pi over the magnitude of g, so this is one-half g over k2 uh, 2 pi over g. So cancellation, this gives me 2 pi over K. Now, we know that the wave vector is also, uh, the wave vector is uh, 2 pi over lambda by definition. Uh, and if you put that in, this is then going to give us lambda. But we know this because it's a definition. We also know it because we know uh, that omega is equal to ck is equal to 2 pi nu is equal to 2 pi c over lambda is equal to c k. So if you go back and just think about uh, uh, optics. Uh, so here we get 2d sine lambda equals, sorry, sine theta is equal to n lambda. So we can return the, the Bragg construction. But there's more constructions that we can derive 
from these conditions, and some of them I, I think are slightly more useful. Uh, one that I think that the first uh, the first time that I understood this is when I was thinking about Lowry diffraction, and that involves uh, the Abel construction. And in the case of Lowry diffraction, this is talking about diffraction from a single X-ray source, or sorry, from a single uh, single crystal. So you've got some X-ray source. You've got a series of you know, collimators. So this X-ray source becomes a thin line. Here you've got a crystal, and you have this set up. Uh, to very carefully control uh, and be able to, to tweak this and, and move it around and tune its position. And then over here, you have a piece of film. And when the x-ray strikes the piece of film, you get simultaneous diffraction at different points uh, on the film. So you may have seen these before, you get these kind of very nice uh, symmetric patterns, and you're essentially getting diffraction from all the planes all at once, and uh, measuring those uh, on a piece of film. So the mathematical construction for working with this is to, let's say, make your uh, reciprocal lattice. So this is our reciprocal lattice point. And then uh, draw in one uh, of your k-vectors, the, the k-vector for the incident light, or the incident x-rays, and let's say they're coming in from this direction. And draw this in different color. Now you draw it remembering that k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, and you have the direction from the uh, orientation of the crystal. You have, you have your uh, orientation of the uh, reciprocal lattice from the orientation of the crystal. You've got k from the x-ray source, you've got the magnitude of k from the x-ray wavelength, and you put the tip of the uh, k-vector at one reciprocal lattice point, and we're going to uh, consider that point zero, zero, zero. And then here is the tail. Now, because energy is conserved, the magnitude of the k prime vector is equal to the magnitude of the incoming. So we can consider uh, diffraction occurring in all possible directions by drawing you have to pardon my really we're drawing, well, okay. Imagine this is a circle. If this was a circle, then you'd have you'd have diff diffraction everywhere that this surface crosses a reciprocal lattice point. And typically the, the circle is larger and the lattice is denser, so you get a lot more diffraction points. But everywhere that it cuts that surface, and this, this is called an Avol sphere.
and this, this sphere's radius is 2 pi over lambda. So this is the, the mathematical construction that you use in order to think about Lowry diffraction. Now I'd like to uh, introduce the Brillouin zone construction. And this is the construction that is uh, most useful for thinking about free electron gases. So in the case of, of uh, this Brillouin zone construction, we start out with delta K is equal to G. And we have G plus K is equal to uh, K prime. So you can think of it as if you know your G, you know your K, then you know the direction of diffraction. Uh, we're going to square both sides to get g plus k squared is equal to k prime squared. Expand this, g squared plus 2g k plus k squared is equal to k prime squared. And because energy is conserved, I can take and I can subtract minus k squared minus k squared. And this is going to go to zero now. So I get g squared plus 2kg is equal to 0, or 2k dot g is equal to g squared. Now we take that and, and multiply it by uh, 1 fourth. we get k times one-half g is equal to g over 2 squared. OK, so what this means is that the condition for diffraction and drawing in my reciprocal lattice is that if I pick a particular lattice point as my origin, say I'll arbitrarily pick that one, and I define a plane that sits exactly between this last point and another one. So let's say that I, I pick uh, this last point. Then any time a vector originating from my origin touches that plane, the condition for diffraction is met, and we have diffraction. So all these are possible k vectors for diffraction. And it's not just this one. But I also have one for the point above it. I have one for the point to the left, one to the point to the right. I then have one between these points. So I've got something that is this, something that does this, it does this, it does this. And I can keep expanding that outward. Uh, but what you see is we get a whole series of these planes, and any time that I get a k-vector 
and it touches any of those lines, I get diffraction. And in the free electron uh, model, we're going to be talking about free electrons that are residing uh, in K space, in reciprocal space, around an origin, and every time one of those vectors uh, touches one of these uh, surfaces, then the uh, electron will diffract. So this is the the Brillouin zone, the Brillouin zone uh, construction, and we'll we'll talk more about Brillouin zones uh, later. I thought it would be good to wrap up this lecture by, by going back to diffraction and uh, talking a little bit more about diffraction and, and how we take that uh, scattering amplitude and uh, think about the atomic basis that is on site. So we have the scattering amplitude, F. take this and we're going to break it down and we're going to talk about diffraction from a specific uh, g vector. So there, there are many possible diffraction vectors, but we're going to just pick one and we're going to talk about uh, the diffraction uh, not just from the crystal, but from the uh, entire cell multiplied by the number of, of, of uh, cells in the crystal. So I want to change this to an F G, so that's for a particular value of G, so a particular HKL plane. So that's the integral over a unicell, dV, n, r, so this is the charge density within that particular unicell, x, i, g dot r. And remember that G, G. Okay. And in this expression, we this have this as N S G. S sub G is called the structure factor. So n is telling you how the number of unicells affects the scattering amplitude. The more unicells, the greater the, the greater the scatter. And Sg is going to talk about the internal uh, structure. So Sg is equal to cell n r i dot r. Now, this uh, charge density has to do with the atoms that are inside the cell. So let's say that we have a certain number of atoms. Let's say we have uh, s atoms. So n r is equal to sum j equals 1 to s n j r minus r s. So uh, this is the This 
going to be the individual atom that's located at uh, point Rs. So the total charge density in the cell is the sum of all the charge densities from the atoms. So that is going to change our structure factor to look like that. So we include the sum over the atoms and let's define that rho is equal to J, which means that oh, I'm sorry. This has to be a J. So back down here at the bottom, when I had the sum, I had to be a sum over the. Uh, J equals 1 to S N J R minus R J. S had to be a J in there, not an S. Sorry about that. Because we're summing over it, not just putting in the, the final term. Okay, uh, what was it doing here? Right. Uh, so that allows us to substitute in. row here, and now for this term, we can substitute in uh, r is equal to rho plus rj, so we can write so we can write uh, x of i g dot r j x of negative i g, g dot rho. Okay. Now, collecting these terms. SG is equal to the sum of J X of negative I G dot R J times the integral over the cell DV N J rho X I G dot rho. Okay. So now what we've done to the structure factor is we've created a term which talks about the reciprocal lattice and we've created a term which deals with the atomic uh, charge densities and this is called the atomic form factor. And it's represented by a little f j. So sg is equal to the sum j equals 1 to s x of negative
negative i g dot r f j. And what's handy is that these atomic form factors, uh, there are lookup tables. So this is a this is a table that I I took from the back of Cullity, and you have these for all of the uh, the atoms. And it breaks up the structure factor uh, in terms of uh, the lattice and the atoms. Now, the structure factor, uh, just in terms of the lattice, is actually fairly significant. So I want to show you a, a quick example of how structure factor uh, is significant for our understanding of diffraction. And some of you may have seen this before, uh, but I'm going to look at the uh, body center cubic, the body center cubic uh, unicell. So if I have a BCC unicell, we have two atoms. We have one atom located at, and I'm choosing to place it at the origin. You can shift them around. It just means you have to do more math. So. Uh, I'm placing one of the origin to be lazy, and the other at one half, one half, one half. Okay, this means that we have a structure factor given here, sum from one to now two. That will look. like this. It's going to look like that. So these x, y, z, those are our atomic positions, and v1, v2, v3, those are our uh, reciprocal lattice uh, values. So substituting in these values, for uh, x, y, and z, I get sg of the body center cubic is equal to f z x of 0, which is 1, plus x minus i pi v1 plus v2 plus v3. A lot of brackets. Okay. Now if I uh, define, and I'm defining this because I know the answer, uh, but you would just brute force this in Excel or, or whatever you have. I'm going to define uh, n is equal to v1 plus v2 plus v3. Then n versus x of minus i pi n. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, dot, 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 dot. So we have a pattern. 
and what this pattern is telling us, based on this having a value of 1, is that if n equals odd, sg is equal to 0. If n is even, sg is equal to 2 fz. So this gives us the rule that if you have a body center cubic crystal, that you only get diffraction if the sum of the HKL planes are even. And uh, in the case of uh, FCC, there's similar rules. Uh, but I just thought I'd show this to you because it's kind of a nice wrap-up of diffraction, considering that we started from uh, just Bragg's Law and uh, then stepped through all of this reciprocal space definitions.